everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Sharon, and this is a channel that is dedicated to all things related to narcissism. I've been married to a covert narcissist for almost 20 years. I'm separated from him now, and what I do with this channel is I use my real life experiences to get information out there to people about what narcissism really is, what it looks like, what it does to you, and what it does to your family. Before I begin today's video, I would just like to say Happy New Year to everybody. I hope everybody watching has a happy, blessed, prosperous, and wonderful 2021. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about narcissists and the police. If you are in a relationship with a narcissist, especially at the end of the relationship where you want to leave the relationship, where you know who this person is and you are trying to leave the relationship, you are at a dangerous point in the relationship. Narcissists don't lose. They play games all the time. And if they know that you know who they are and that you want to leave, they're going to cause you misery. They always do this. And they have the absolute potential to call the police on you, to try to get you arrested, to try to have your kids taken away from you. Never underestimate a narcissist. If you're in a relationship with a narcissist, you are in an abusive relationship. It doesn't matter if they're physically assaulting you or not. Emotional abuse is real abuse. And on average, it takes somebody six attempts to leave an abusive relationship. And that includes emotional abuse. During that time, that's the most dangerous time of the relationship because when you're with an abuser, you're with an unstable person. This is not somebody that you're going to amicably end a relationship with and just wish each other well and go on with your life. This is somebody that wants to hurt you, that gets a high off hurting you. They have never loved you. They're using you. And if you dare leave them, they're going to have a narcissistic injury and they will attempt to cause you problems like a hundred percent of the time. So in that time when you're at, you know, the back and forth part of the relationship, that six attempts, this is when, if you've ever heard stories about people who are physically abused and they'll leave, come back, leave, come back, and then they're killed. And people like us will look at the situation and say, how could they do that? Why would they possibly go back? That's crazy. That's us. When you're trying to leave and you come back, trying to leave, come back, it happens in physical and emotional abusive relationships. It's the most dangerous time. So I'm not saying you shouldn't leave. You should leave. But you need to be aware of what a narcissist is capable of. And in narcissists, one advantage that victims of narcissistic abuse have is that once you know who the person is, you can predict their behavior. All narcissists are capable of doing this. Do not make the mistake of thinking, well, my narcissist would never do that. My husband, my wife would never do that. They'll never do it until they do. So I'll tell you what happened to me and I'll tell you what I've heard has happened to other people and then talk about what you can do. So in December of 2019, well, I guess from August to December of 2019, this was my back and forth. Kicked him out, let him come back. Kicked him out, let him come back. This kept kept happening. So in December of 2019, at one point, I just lost it. I was at the end of my rope. I was worried about my own mental instability because he was causing me anguish. It was constant silent treatments, constant cruelty. And he started being really cruel to the kids. He was always yelling at them. He was horrible. So one day he came home and he was, of course, ignoring me. And I said to him, you have to leave. I cannot have you here. You're driving me crazy. If you are going to ignore me, if you're going to be so cruel, you have to get out. So he didn't say anything. Of course, he was giving me the silent treatment. So he started packing a bag. He just started getting stuff. He was in the closet. I went into the closet and I, I had had it at that point. So I was yelling at him. I was telling him exactly what I thought of him. And at one point I grabbed his arm and I was trying to get him to turn around and face me. Of course I couldn't. There's a huge size difference between the two of us. I'm five foot three, like 105, 110 pounds. He is six foot three and like 250. So he weighs more than double what I weigh. I couldn't move him, but I did pull his arm or tried to get him to move. And when that didn't work, I said to him, you know what? I'm done. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stop hiding who you really are. I'm going to tell people exactly the type of person that you are, exactly the type of things that you do. And then he turned and looked at me and he was livid. He had hate in his eyes and he left the closet and he went into the, the other room, the living room. 
and he started banging his head against the wall. He just started hitting himself really hard. Like he was banging over and over and over while screaming, mommy's hurting me. Ow, 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 mommy's hurting me. So my kids come out of their rooms. They're watching their father beat his own head on the wall. He's bloody. He's getting bruised. He's really hurting himself while screaming. And I'm just standing there in shock. My daughter was crying. My son was begging his father to stop. It was a really bad scene. And I was terrified. I didn't know what he was going to do. So I called 911. So I'm on the call, I'm on the phone with 911 while my husband's beating himself up, screaming that I'm hurting him. And they told me to stay away from him. So I told my kids, stay upstairs, stay in your rooms. And I, we have like a little old balcony thing so they can look down and see him. I know you can't picture my house, but that's, that was the scene. So they went to their rooms and then I could suddenly hear sirens coming. So the police, once my husband heard the sirens, he stopped. And so the police came, I let them in the house, the ambulance there, and they immediately separated the two of us. So I was in the garage and my husband was in the driveway. So I could hear him talking to the police and talk. I guess he maybe was talking to the paramedics at the, at first because he was, I could hear him say, he's saying, I couldn't believe it. I was doing nothing. I was just minding my own business. And all of a sudden she just grabbed me and was like pushing me into the wall and hurting me. She was banging my head against the wall. I couldn't believe it. I was, I couldn't believe it. He was lying. And I know like for anybody that knows narcissists, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, of course he would do that. Why wouldn't he do that? I never would have believed it ever, never. So he's telling these people, he's telling the paramedics, he's telling the police what I've been doing, that I'm abusing him. And he's so scared. And I look what, look what I did to him. He's bleeding. He's got bruising all over his face. I did this. So the policeman starts talking to me. So I had a, they had someone talking to me and he said, well, I don't, could you, I'm not sure you could do this. He's like, there's a big, there's a noticeable size difference between the two of you. So tell me what happened. So I told him exactly what happened. And then he told me that he was going to go talk to my husband and just to wait here. So he left, he's talking to my husband, he comes back and he says, well, he's telling me that you've been, you were assaulting him and you grabbed his arm. Is this true? I was 100% honest with the police. This is what, I'm not going to advise you to lie to the police, but in a, as we get into the video, I'm going to tell you, as we get into what you can do, keep in mind this. I, I admitted it. I said, yes, I did. I was like, I'd never put him into the wall. I did not bang his head. I was like, but I did grab his arm. And he's like, all right, well, I just need to tell you that that is domestic violence and that I'm supposed to arrest you. I couldn't believe it. I could have been arrested for this. So I was like, but I didn't hurt him. I just pulled his arm to have him face me. And he's like, it doesn't matter. You're not legally allowed to touch anybody else. That technically is domestic abuse. So and I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I'm not trying to make light of domestic abuse, but I wasn't domestically abusing him. I pulled his arm. So, but that technically is domestic abuse. He told me that he could not in good conscience arrest me because he didn't trust my husband alone with my children. He told me that my husband wanted me arrested. He wanted me taken away from the house and he wanted to stay there with the kids. So thank God. I know I have God watching over me because he was supposed to arrest me, but he said he just, he could not in good conscience do it. He's like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. He's like, but I, I can't do it. I cannot leave him alone with your kids. I really do not trust this person at all. He said, we're going to try to get your husband to leave. We can't make him leave. He's like, this is crucial for you to understand as well. If you own a house with somebody, if you're in a lease with somebody, they don't have to leave. The only way you can make them leave is by getting a restraining order. So he's like, you could try to get a, an emergency restraining order. He's like, you'll probably get it. You can get one right now. He's like, but it's only good until I can't remember what time, maybe nine in the morning, whatever, whenever the court's opened. He's like, then you're going to have to go to court and get a more permanent one. The problem you have, and this is something to be aware of. It sounds easy and I've talked to other people and people like, well, just get a restraining order. You can't just get a restraining order. You have, there has to be real cause. And I understand that because, you know, it wouldn't be right for people just to get restraining orders on people. It ruins people's lives to have a restraining order out on you, unwarranted. It's not fair. So I, I do understand that. But when you're in a case like I was, or maybe some of you are, this is a real issue. 
You're stuck with somebody. You can't make them leave. And then, of course, a narcissist has almost certainly financially abused you. So it's not like you have cash or money available to just move out or to set up another household. This person can be with you. And this is what really happens. This person can be stay with you and you're stuck. Because if you go ahead and try to get a restraining order and you don't get it, you have now bolstered the narcissist. They win and they're loving that. And now they know nothing's stopping them. They can do anything they want. As long as they don't cross over a legal line, they can make your life a living hell. They could drive you to suicide. So this is a real issue. So he said I could get the, you know, I could get the emergency restraining order. That would be into effect until the courts open. I think that's what it was. So then I could get another one. So I was like, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to get one. I, I want, I, I was going to, but then he said he was going to leave. So I was like, right, I'm not going to get it. Then he said, but he could come back at any time. There's nothing holding him from coming back to this house. He's like, so please think about this. But I knew he wasn't domestically, he wasn't assaulting me. He wasn't physically violent. I didn't think I had a leg to stand on getting a restraining order. Then, so he, he left. They got him out of there. He refused medical treatment. After they said they weren't going to arrest me, he, he left. Actually, you know what? I should go back for a second. He didn't leave right away. It was actually more of the story now that I think about it. They brought him back into the house. They, they went with him as he went around the house so he could pack things to leave. While he was packing things to leave, he started accusing me of theft. He was telling the police, I mean, this is all lies. He's telling the police that I was stealing his mail from him, that he wasn't able to get mail. I was stealing all his mail. What had happened is we had had a snowstorm recently and there was like the the way the, the mailman was horrible. He wasn't delivering the mail because we didn't have, we had too much snow in front of the mailbox. So his truck couldn't get in front of it. So he was, I found this out later. He wasn't delivering mail. So we weren't getting mail. My husband said I was stealing the mail. It wasn't true. We weren't getting mail because the snowstorm that had happened a few days ago. But according to him, I was stealing his mail. Then he started telling the police that it's so horrible that he has to leave because he has a heart condition and he's really sick and he doesn't have any family nearby. He doesn't have any friends he can go to. And it's so unfair that I'm trying to hurt him. You know, there's all lies. Then I noticed that I didn't have my phone. So I was looking around for my phone and then I asked him, I was like, do you have my phone? And he pulled it out of his pocket. He had tried to steal my phone. Later, that was a big issue. My husband was wildly angry with me about this because he said to me, how dare you? How dare you have to bring that up right in front of the police? That made me look bad, right? He stole my phone, but it made, and it made him look bad, but it was my fault. He tells me, I was going to put it in the mailbox. I was going to leave it for you. I wasn't going to, I was just taking it for a little while. I mean, this is the mindset they have. So finally he left. Once he left, I like just the floodgates opened. I was hyperventilating. I was crying. I couldn't stop. Like I was under complete control while he was there. And I just, it just, it just opened. I couldn't stop. So the police didn't want to leave because I was so upset. So they were trying to get someone to come over to the house, but I didn't want to tell anybody I had had this terrible issue. I don't want to call any of my friends and have them come over and know that this had happened. So they called my pastor for me. And this man was so wonderful. He talked to me on the phone. He got me calmed down. He got me to a point where I could function again. And then we're, I was going to, he told me, you know, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll talk about this. It's going to be all right. So I calmed down and the police were wonderful. They were like, why don't you just hang out with your kids? Maybe watch a movie. I mean, they were really good to me. So everything was all right. And before they left, police officers said to me, look, hopefully this won't happen, but I just, I need to tell you that because your husband accused you of domestic violence and we know he didn't do it, he's like, but there is the accusation child protective services might get in touch with you. So he left next day, child protective services got in touch with me. I can't, so I'm already going through this traumatic event and, and you know, he was lying. He was causing all this, all these, all these problems. This is what it's so crucial to understand. He didn't care. He's not coming to his senses. He's happy about this. So I get this call from Child Protective Services. So I'm talking to this woman from Child Protective Services. They had to meet my children. I can't remember now if it was within 24 hours or 48 hours. They had to, I think it was 24 hours. They had to meet my kids and interview them. That was unbelievably traumatic. So I had to talk to my kids. I had to tell them they had to speak to this person who we knew had the power to take them away. It was very scary. So I had to clean my whole house. I mean, I was making everything perfect. I was so sick. I was so upset. I was so stressed out. 
So this woman from Child Protective Services came over. Now, she was very kind. She was very nice. She was very gentle. She read me the police report, wanted to see if everything was accurate on the police report. And it was, it was everything that had happened. So it was, there was, it, you know, it said right in the police report that they believed me, but they still had to do this. I had to have them call two people. I had to have two people interviewed by Child Protective Services because I was accused of domestic violence. They needed character witnesses, essentially. So I had, so one person was my pastor. He had known about this. And this is where I don't, you know, I know not everybody believes in God, but I really believe that God has been protecting me in this. About six months earlier, now I had been confiding to my pastor about some of this, and this is something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, about things that you can do. And he set me up with another woman at the church whose husband had been abusing her in the past, and she had gotten out of the relationship. And he suggested I meet with her and talk to her. I did. I didn't want to. Like I, when he told me that, I really wanted to just be like, I'm not going to talk to her. But I did, and she was my other witness. If I hadn't spoken to her, and she completely understood, if I hadn't spoken to her, I would have had to get somebody involved that had no idea what was happening in this relationship. That's more trauma on top of everything else. It took two months for them to clear me. Two long months. I didn't know what was happening, what was going to happen with my kids. I'm getting calls from Child Protective Services every so often because they told me that I shouldn't have my husband at the house. He shouldn't be at the house. So, And he wasn't. He, he, he still hasn't come back. He's, he's gone. But they would call me every once in a while to check in and make sure he wasn't at the house. It was traumatic, finally. So it wasn't until February that I got cleared of abuse when he had tried to get me arrested. If they had... You know, and remember, like I had pulled him. So technically I did physically abuse him. I did physically assault him. They could have taken my kids away. This is a real thing. So this really happened. And since this has happened, I have heard of many other cases where other people have had similar instances, but they've had it worse. I have heard about people that have actually gotten arrested. Remember, the policeman was supposed to arrest me. And I know if I had been arrested, if I had been taken away, he would have slept just fine in bed that night. He would have ignored the kids, whatever. He wouldn't have comforted them at all. Their mother's in jail. He doesn't care. He would have slept just fine. He wasn't going to get me out. He wasn't going to renege on what he said. This has happened to other people where they're in jail and now all of a sudden their spouse is alone with their kids. Or now they have to go to anger management classes. They have to miss work and they have to get lawyers and that costs a lot of money. Because when I when I was looking into getting a restraining order, when I was wondering if that's what I should do, because I didn't know if he was going to try to come back, it was going to cost me $3,000, not to get the restraining order, but to hire the lawyer, just to hire the lawyer. And, you know, and she said, you know, if he, cause he, my husband said that he was going to stay away from the house. She's like, well, if he said he's going to stay away from the house, of course he hasn't. He's actually come and hung out in the backyard. I'll just see him randomly. These, uh, these people are really abusive, but she said, if he's saying that he's not going to come to the house, that he's going to leave you alone, you're not going to get the restraining order. And then he's probably going to come right back. So these are real issues that people have when you are with a narcissist, you have serious issues to deal with. So there are people that get actually arrested, have to go to anger management classes, lose their jobs, have their kids taken away from them, all on a narcissist lie. And you can never count on a narcissist to come to their senses to think, oh, I was angry in that moment. I shouldn't have said that. It's not true. That's not what narcissists do. So this is what you need to do. This is what you need to take care to make sure that you cover all your bases. When I spoke to the lawyer and I told her what had happened with me pulling his arm and admitting this to the police, the first thing she said to me was, the police are not your friend. Do not confess anything to the police. So I do not advise that you lie to the police at all. But if you are in a situation where there's a, something like that happened, do not admit that you did it. Say nothing because that can get you into a lot of trouble. I didn't abuse him, but I pulled his arm. That's considered abuse. If you touch anybody, that's considered abuse. Never admit it. You can talk to your lawyer about that and let them handle that. Because if you get arrested 
you have to get a lawyer. You have to call somebody to help you take care of this because you cannot handle a narcissist on your own. So I do trust the police, but she said, do not. So I would be very careful what you say to the police. Another thing, document everything. Make sure that you hold, if you have to call the police, get the, a copy of the police report. Write down, have a little diary, write down everything that you've done. My friend I have who was also abused by her husband told me that she kept a diary that had like little secret codes in it where she said thing every time, my husband does not abuse me physically, her husband did. She had a little secret like code that she wrote every time that he abused her. So later when she went to court, because she did get a restraining order on him, when she went to court, she was able to say, he abused me here, here. Like she had documented, you know, she had documented everything. Keep good records. Keep everything. If they threaten you, keep a diary of everything that they do. Make sure you keep it hidden from the narcissist, but keep a diary of, diary of everything they do. Get any copies of police reports. Talk to other people. If I hadn't spoken to my pastor, if I hadn't spoken to my friend who was also abused, I would have had nobody. I would have had to call people that have no idea anything that's going on. And that would have affected my life even more because I would have had to call the friends that I have are friends of my kids. So they're my friends now in the last year I've made a lot of friends. But prior to that, these are the people I would have had to call were people that knew my kids. And then like this is going to affect my kids because who's going to want their kids hanging out with my kids when they know there's abuse in the family, when, when the child protective services are involved? It would have been horrible. It would have been even worse. So I would advise if you are a member of a church, I mean, you want to use discretion talk to people, tell somebody that you trust. And maybe it's just a therapist. If you're in therapy, tell your therapist, tell a pastor, tell a priest, tell a rabbi, tell somebody that can help you that because you know, my, I told my pastor, and he set me up with somebody that had also been going through abuse. Now I knew this woman, I didn't know she was going through abuse. He helped me with that. There are people out there, document everything, make sure you have yourself protected. And make sure you have money. Try, I've said this in another video, try and build yourself a little stash. No matter what, if you have $50, anything, because you never know. You are dealing with somebody that is completely unpredictable. Somebody that will hurt you. They don't have a problem with it. You are in a dangerous situation. You can get out. It can get better. But when you're with a narcissist, you know, in general, I think it's a good idea to think on the positive side. If you're with a narcissist, think on the negative side. Think about what they could do because they will hurt you. Narcissists are the type of people that will enact revenge and they will enact revenge by trying to hurt your kids. This is what they do. So keep records, tell somebody, don't live in isolation. That's what the narcissist wants you to do. Basically, if the narcissist wants you to do something, you know it's not for your own good and do the opposite. Never underestimate a narcissist ever. Thank you for watching this video. I know it's a long one. I just really think it's so important to understand that this is a real reality. If you're with a narcissist, never make the mistake of thinking it can't happen to me. You can get out. You can get freedom. It's not a hopeless situation, but you're with a dangerous person that you need to take precautions with. God bless you all. Please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel. Please leave a comment. If this has happened to you, if you've had an issue like this, please leave it in the comments to help other people. Very grateful for everybody. And again, Happy New Year. God bless you. I will see you on Monday.